welcome to this session around looking at busting myths about women in innovation. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to chair this session today on International Women's Day alongside three such inspiring speakers. My name is Elspeth Finch. I'm the founder of a company called IAND, which is a digital supply chain analytics and collaboration platform. And it's really there to help companies work with SMEs at scale, supporting the government's levelling up agenda by helping large companies work with diverse SMEs from across the UK to drive innovation, jobs and growth. In terms of the agenda for today's session, I'll be providing a short introduction on the four myths that we're going to challenge and a few stats to show the status of the innovation landscape now. We'll then discuss each of these myths in turn, um, led by one of our four speakers, and at around 12.45, we'll open to questions from the floor. Um, please can I ask that you put questions in the Q&A. We're going to try and tackle as many of them as possible. But what I'd also recommend is please can you upvote questions which are very similar to ones that you're looking for, because that will enable us to cover as many as we can within the time. Um, just also a final reminder, today's webinar is being recorded, so it's just if you're writing any questions, just a quick reminder on that. So before I move on to the challenges, I'd like to introduce three speakers who are absolutely the heart of innovation to lift the lid on what it really means to be an entrepreneur and an ally too. You'll shortly hear from Dr. Devaki Bata. So Dev is an experienced biotech professional with 15 years technical and commercial experience. food, healthcare, and industrial bioprocessing applications. She's also widely and actively involved in the wider UK innovation landscape, um, playing an industrial advisory role for national funding and innovation agencies. We can also hear from Paulina Skaliska. Paulina is an entrepreneur, angel investor, and TEDx speaker and founder of Grantree which helps tech startups navigate the complex world of government funding. Um, and it's an open culture company, which pioneered an open salary scheme and empowering culture governed by a holacracy. Pauline is also a seed investor herself, a startup mentor, and often features as a speaker at technology conferences worldwide. And finally, we have an ally. We've got John Salkett. So John is appearing on behalf of the IET, where he's a fellow, a long-standing member of the Innovation Policy Panel, and is currently head of Scientific Innovation Strategic University and External Partnerships for BP. But he'll also be drawing his experiences from a career, career spanning Kinetic, ICI, and Schlumberger. So what are the challenges for women in innovation? I thought it'd be useful to start with some key stats from the VC funding space. So um, if you can just move on to the next slide, please. So these are coming from Tech Nation and their report on diversity and inclusion, which spans the year 2009 to 2019. And it makes for a pretty stark reading. We can see in terms of VC funding, there's three core challenges. There's a challenge around gender. Um, if you look at the funding landscape, less than 3% of funding went to all female teams compared to nearly 69% for all male teams. And even those which are mixed, it's still, you know, only 28% of the funding. So that is a pretty stark statistic to start with. When we look at the sort of combined challenges of ethnicity and gender, we find that, especially for Black female entrepreneurs, it's a really, really tough space for them, with less than 0.02% of funding going to Black female entrepreneurs. And there's a final challenge around age, and this is coming from the US and the Y Combinator, a really well-known um, seed space. And there was a comment made um, by Paul Graham that the cutoff investors' heads is 32, which is a little bit scary for those of us who are no longer in our 30s. And so when we look at these combination of challenges, we realize that some real myth busting that we need to do and make sure that we know that innovation is for everyone. Can we move on to the next slide? So because of that today, we want to really challenge the four challenges which we see heard in different spaces, which are about do women lack confidence? Women don't take risks. Women don't lead companies in technology and women have to change. So what we really want to do is challenge those four myths and look at taking examples from real life experience around the fact that women are absolutely leaders in innovation. So if you can stop sharing the screen now, what I'd like to do is tackle the very first myth, which is women lack confidence. 
And I'm first of all going to go across to Dev and ask you the first question, which is what gave you the confidence to start not one, but two companies? Okay, so uh, thank you, Elspeth. This is a really interesting question. And um, to answer this, I actually need to take you back in time to what happened before I actually started my companies. So I was lucky that I was exposed to entrepreneurship quite early on in my career. Um, I did my PhD at an applied research institute in Cambridge under one of the most business minded academics you could ever meet. He was a serial entrepreneur with multiple spin out companies and he liked to take people outside of their comfort zone. So he was renowned for making um, biologists do physics, physicists do business, all with completely hands off supervision. So if you like, we were all thrown in the deep end and in order to survive, you'd have to be an independent outside of the box thinker. So stepping from that out into the real world, I still recall working for a company in the south of England where I wasn't just the only female, if you don't include the receptionist that is, um, I was the only ethnic minority, I was the only life scientist amongst engineers who spoke a completely different language, and I couldn't have been more different, and I certainly wasn't very popular, which brought many challenges, as you can imagine. However, again, the reason, one of the reasons I survived was because our CEO, he was very open-minded, he gave me completely free reign to build up my own niche within the company and measured success objectively rather than subjectively. So again, from there, if you fast forward then a few years until when I actually started the companies, I guess you could say that I'd already gained the confidence um, through necessity by carving out a niche for myself. And unlike many other entrepreneurs who may have started a company off the back of a previously successful exit, or as a side venture, um, complementing an existing secure position, I actually left a full-time well-paid job to take the plunge. But I had um, family support, um, little responsibility, and most importantly, I, I could afford to take the risk financially, which many others wouldn't have been in, in that position. Um, another influencer I haven't mentioned yet is actually my father, um, a scientist himself, um, has always pushed me to be the very best that I can be from a very young age. And as a first generation immigrant to 1960s Britain had always instilled in me that as a minority, I would need to work twice as hard to be considered half as good. So in my case, as you can see, a lot of my role models have actually been male, which to me highlights the importance of men championing women in the workplace, as well as women championing women. And so if I can just get back to the point of your question, Elspeth, which was what gave me the confidence, I would say that this can be summed up in two things. So number one, personal resilience from going against the grain and a drive to prove everyone wrong. And two, being empowered to do so by some exceptional role models who created an environment that allowed me to thrive. So I hope that somewhat answers your question, Elspeth. <laughs> I think it does and thank you Deb I think it's really good to hear the kind of the personal experience around it can I ask you a quick couple of quick questions around it so I think that piece around personal resilience I think is really important but also the kind of inner confidence that you had um would you say that people thought of you as a confident person or was it quite a sort of or is it quite sort of innate and quite hidden to you yes yeah, that, that is a very interesting I would say this has changed throughout my career because I would say as a very young person I wasn't inherently confident whereas I would say that most people that have known me over the last decade would ab absolutely describe me as confident so I think that this relates to again it, it's a lot to do with environment you see I think without going too much into the details a lot of the confidence thing actually came for me from a very young age I wasn't a confident child at all and I had to go against the grain for all sorts of reasons personal as well as professional before I sort of got into the workplace so that kind of gave me that innate sort of you know innate confidence in the sense that I want to you know I need to prove myself I need to prove people wrong I think as I got into the workplace yeah absolutely because I had to learn to be quite you know I had to speak up otherwise I was ignored right so therefore that kind of became ingrained. So I would say that my confidence is learned behavior rather than something that's innate. And, you know, I talked about empowerment. So in my early career days, I do remember being sat in, you know, boardrooms and things while I was very, very different. So at the beginning, you could, you know, I'm sure you know else, but where sometimes you sort of feel like, well, maybe I should just take a step back, sit and listen, not, not really sure if I've got any value add. 
but actually through that experience you, you realize that actually you, you know your opinion counts just as much as anybody else's and you you kind of um, I think, yeah, it's been learned over the years. I would say everybody would describe me as confident now, but it didn't necessarily come naturally to me at the start. That sounds very familiar. I was an incredibly shy child, and I'm sure that I'm going to speak to John in a second. I'm not sure he would necessarily have anticipated that when working together. Um, John, can I ask you a quick question, which is because obviously you've worked with a lot of men and women in your career across a number of years in your career. Do you see the way that confidence is articulated as being different between especially some of the men and women at sort of earlier career stages? Yeah, so I don't think there's any reason why you should have that confidence being articulated differently. I mean, um, it's very easy to fall into a trap of starting to trade stereotypes around what makes a female leader worse versus what makes a male leader. In reality, this enormous difference within each of those genders and probably more so than you get between the two. Um, certainly you can have different challenges and there could be different perceptions around how you come across but yeah, I'd always go back to that main point which is trying to be as authentic as you can be. I think that's a very very good point. And um, Polina did you have anything to add to this sort of piece this sort of myth around confidence? Sorry, I was trying to speak on mute. I think it's a really good point, and it's certainly a myth that women have, don't have enough confidence. I'm seeing in my space, working with more than 600 tech entrepreneurs, many really confident women who take a lot of risks, which we'll come to later, and uh, certainly not lacking in their ability to make decisions and really thrive. So it's a big myth and a big myth that some investors sadly still believe in, and I really hope it will change soon. Thank you very much, Helena. And I think it'd be useful to just do a final comment from you, Deb, around risk, because that falls on neatly into our next myth around risk. But I think one of the key things you're talking about is that need to have personal resilience. And I think that's just such a key part of confidence, especially if you're founding a company, because you need the resilience not only to take the risk to start it, but actually keep going because it's not going to be smooth sailing. So do you see with other founders that you work with um, that that sort of how important that personal resilience is? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because when you, when you when you start a company, it's nothing like having, you know, a normal job. And I'll put that in, in inverted commas because it's like, you, you know, I, I don't need to tell, 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 tell you, Elspeth, but, you know, being a startup CEO is like, you know, being in the boardroom, but also being the tea lady, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing, there's nothing that's, um, you know, everything's up for grabs and you have to be able to do, you know, everything you like and everything you don't like, but also importantly, when you start up companies, there's not always that um, cushion. You don't know where it's going to go. You don't know that it's going to succeed. Often, you, you know, that, that there's not a lot in it in terms of income. You do it because of a personal passion to build up something down the road. So with all those things, you have to be um, not afraid to fail, you know. So, yes, the, the risk, the risk taking is, is definitely a part of it. And like like the others have said, I mean, you know, I, I you know, I've worked with both female and male co-founders and. You know, I, you know, I can honestly say, yes, of course, there, there, there are for multiple reasons, fewer women in the space. But of the women I have worked with, I don't find them any risk averse, any any more risk averse than male counterparts. And if anything, I would say the opposite. For the reasons I have said is that the, the, the women that I do work with have taken an inordinate amount of risk to get to where they are already before beginning to start a company. And I think that's a really interesting challenge. And I know that when I, I set up my first company when I was 24, and one of the things which was so important to me was knowing that people had started companies, those companies had failed, but yet they were still thriving in their careers. And I think it's not this sort of naivety around thinking that startups are always going to be successful, but actually having the role models around, actually it's okay to take risk and you will be okay if you take risk. I certainly found very reassuring personally. Um, I think that comes on to that sort of second myth beautifully. So I think Paulina, we've tied you up to this one, which is um, the great risk, the myth, the myth that women don't take risks. 
Oh, so, I feel so passionate about that one, Elspeth. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your view around what could give you, why did you take risks in starting your firm, you know, and how did you manage them? Yeah, let me tell you my personal story. So how I started in the tech space. So first of all, I moved to the UK in 2006, uh, having left Poland where I was born and I grew up. So that was the first risk that I took and I was absolutely loving it. So I came to study it, to be an affiliate student at UCL for a year to begin with. And it's then that I started uh, going to those um, tech, tech meetups. And in those tech meetups, I would mostly meet bearded geeks that would talk about product market fit and jump on pizza and have pints of beer. And I had no idea at that point what product market fit actually meant, but I decided I was going to find out. And I decided that those people who are talking with enormous chutzpah about how they are going to disrupt an entire industry and make the mark on the world, I just fell in love with that attitude and I really, really wanted to be one of them. So having decided to actually stay in London after my year of study, which is another, another risk that I took, um, I started networking. I met quite a few interesting people on the tech scene. I met my first co-founder who was at the time 20, maybe 25 years my senior. And we started the first company together, which was which precedes Grant Tree, and that was a platform that was meant to help creative entrepreneurs find investment, find grants, find office space, so all sorts of services that kind of incubated companies and helped them grow. Uh, so another risk that I took, I started a company having absolutely no idea uh, what I was doing. Uh, Thankfully, I had a business partner that was very much clued up and I learned a lot from him at that point. Another risk that I took to raise some money for myself, I decided that I was going to pitch myself to a few companies in Poland that were selling products internationally, but not currently exporting to the UK. And I was going to market myself to them as a UK country director. Now, bear in mind that I just... <laughs> It was starting my career. So I had absolutely no claim to be a UK country director. But I have found uh, maybe five interesting, thriving software companies. I told them, oh, you, you don't have a UK country director in the UK. How about you get one? Here, here I am. And two of, those, two of the five of those companies uh, actually decided to bring me in for, in, for a conversation. And one of them actually made me an offer, which was uh, awesome. And I started my career uh, having not worked in the tech industry before as a UK country director. So that was a very, very interesting ride. And um, the next the story of how Grantree was born. So, so having worked in the as a freelancer kind of um, supplying my services of UK country directorship to, <laughs> to, uh, to a company abroad, having raised some money for myself, I decided it was, it was time to get entrepreneurial again. So I started Grant Tree. Uh, Grant Tree was started with my then boyfriend, now husband, which was yet another risk. A lot of uh, people we knew told us at the time that we would split up and they would not know who to be friends with anymore, that it would lead to humongous problems having a personal relationship on top of a business relationship. But we decided to persevere anyway. And in that very company, which is now uh, over 50 people strong and has raised over 200 million sterling worth of funding for tech startups and scale-ups in the UK. In that company, we took a humongous risk to implement some very, very interesting principles and very interesting frameworks that we used to govern ourselves and operate. So uh, in Grantree, people actually set their own salaries. So um, they're empowered to research the market, uh, keep in touch with recruiters and know at any point in time how much they're actually worth and to not really pitch themselves, but to propose to the company um, what they should be earning. In my company, we also use holacracy as a system I, alternative to hierarchy to govern ourselves and to, uh, to uh, operate. 
And in that system, uh, there is no hierarchy of people, only hierarchy of work, which means that nobody is a boss of anybody else. Everybody is actually their own manager. Um, so in that company, that we've, we've taken enormous risk to be able to implement the principles and the culture that we we dreamt of and to create a kind of workplace where we would want to work if we're looking for a job today. So here I am uh, with uh, a successful company and um, with a little bit of money. Uh, personally, most of my money is still invested in the company. What did, what did I decide to do? I decided to start investing in very early stage companies, which is again, a super risky decision that not many people in my position having not acquired much wealth yet make. But I decided that I really, really wanted to um, give back to the tech community and become an angel investor. So that's what I have done. And I've now invested in over 10 companies uh, in the seed stage of their development. And I'm hoping to do this more and more as I acquire more, more personal wealth. So here is a story that proves that you can take numerous risks and be successful as a woman in tech. I think that's just, in so many ways, it's just so many different parts of an inspiring story. Um, I think one of the things, there's a couple of sort of threads that came out, which I thought were really interesting, is how much values drives your business and how much values drives your approach to risk. And I think that's something which really sort of seems to be a really important thread for you. Um, one of the things which I wanted to ask is, how do you handle it when the risks that you take don't play out in the way that you anticipate? So when, how do you learn from failure? I move on quite quickly. I definitely take into consideration, okay, I've taken this risk. This is how it's panned out. It's not panned out in the way I would have hoped it would. Um, here's the learning. Uh, we've, for example, there was an enormous learning around, uh, around the time when we decided to acquire a big office space and rent out spaces within that, within that office building to other companies. And that really didn't work out in the way we've hoped. And we lost quite a bit of money in the process, but we've learned our lesson. It was a costly lesson and we moved on. So I think it, what's really important to me is to actually understand what went wrong, why it went wrong and move, move quickly and look at another decision that we can make to mitigate the, the risks that have, arise, that, have, that have arisen. So is there something which is around almost like normalizing failure to understand how you approach risk? Because if we, I, and I think Deb, you're saying the same, you know, if you're starting a company, everybody knows that it doesn't come without risk. It's just actually normalizing the fact it does have risk and that's okay. You take the risk and you learn from it every day to make sure that you can make sure that you can be as successful as you can. So is there something about us being able to sort of normalize it and really normalize the fact that women do take risks? Absolutely. Um, I think it's, super important to understand that all that the risks you're taking won't all pan out in the way you would hope it's super important to to normalize fa failure it's super important to learn from it and in actual fact i'm in the midst of preparing an online summit which will be um, aimed at uh, successful entrepreneurs which will feature successful entrepreneurs who have taken risks and failed talking just about their failure so um this is what i'm doing and i'm really kind of keen to see how that will help entrepreneurs in my community to take more risks and fail more and dev do you have any reflections on it because you're obviously talking about risk quite a bit and your sort of perceptions of risk when you started yeah I, I do actually i also have a question for you paulina because go ahead dev i love your questions <laughs> aspects of your story that obviously relate to mine it's all just you know challenges and finding your feet and navigating yes so were there any times in your journey you know in Grantry and even before where you thought oh my god what am I doing you know that self-doubt maybe maybe this was the wrong move and god and, all the time there's just that, what, so what, much what doubt you through it yeah, there's just so much doubt, particularly if you're implementing cultures such as ours, when you um, start to see that 
wow, we're spending so much time on our internal governance, for example, or people are spending so much time on figuring out what their salary should be instead of making the company money. So there is actually some short term losses that um, are, you know, to do with how we've decided to govern the company. And there are those moments of self-doubt when you think, what am I doing? Why did we it wouldn't life be so much simpler if we didn't kind of follow our dreams and our values and wouldn't it be simpler to just focus on shorter term term games gains but um it's super important during those times for for myself to have the bigger why in mind to actually know why you're doing what you're doing to know that um temporary sacrifices of profit um quite often mean that you can gain more in the longer term. So for me, it's just the awareness, awareness of the bigger why and what you're doing, what you're doing. Yeah, and I, I know I would absolutely agree with that. I think um, I, I've dealt with several times in my sort of um, um, career in building these startups where I've even worked with colleagues that sometimes would say, oh, well, you know, maybe we should just abandon this or wait, maybe actually we shouldn't be doing this, we should be doing that. And actually, there are many, many people are sort of, like you said, short term thinkers, because they're only thinking about what happens tomorrow or the day afterwards. But I would agree that actually the key thing is to never lose sight of the vision, you know, For and sure. that, even though you might have to sort of, you know, pivot here and there and slightly change what you do tomorrow to get to where you want it to be in two years, you, you've still you've still got your eye on that end goal. And that 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 is something that you know really resonates with me thanks dev and i know we're kindred spirits women working in small companies small <laughs> and medium-sized companies yeah totally and elspeth of course <laughs> and john and jonathan <laughs> we're all in the same boat and it's yeah we need to support each other um we need to support each other because it is a bumpy ride it is um uh we're not not a well-trodden path it is a path of doubts that will frequently occur but it's so important to have your support community and to really have your bigger why in mind. I 100% agree and I think the other thing sort of building both of your points is also there's that confidence which is if you don't bet on yourself then why would anyone else bet on you and mm -hmm. I think there's something we should get a lot of confidence from going actually I believe in myself I believe in my vision I'm going to build a company around it because there's that you need that inner confidence to do that but I think it's quite powerful as well to have that confidence in your own ability. Yes. Um, I've just seen that there's a comment that's coming through the messaging box. Can I just put a reminder, if you can put some questions in the Q&A, we haven't had any in Q&A yet, but there's Susan, I've noticed it in the panellist chat, so we'll make sure that we come onto your question, but just a sort of reminder around that. Um, I think I want to sort of move on, if everyone's happy, into uh, the third myth which is around women don't lead technology companies. And I thought it'd be useful for us to do a rapid fire and just go, well, what, what are the female leaders that inspire us? Which ones do we know? So um, Paulina, sort of, who are the people, who are the sort of female founders that you're inspired by? Yeah, so at the moment, I'm really inspired by Eileen Burbage, since I'm still a beginner angel investor. So she is a um, tech, tech advocate, tech envoy. Uh, appointed by British Treasury, and she mm. is the founder, co-founder of Passion Capital. I'm very inspired by her, by how powerful she is, knowledgeable she is. And she's, at some point when I was giving a presentation uh, for my company, and I was actually um, giving her as an example of somebody I'm interested in and inspired by, I found a photo of her with, I think, uh, three yeah. or four children. And I was, I was just blown away that this super successful career woman has managed to successfully combine raising a family with uh, being a super successful woman in tech. So she would be one. Um, another one would be Angel Gambino. So serial multi-exited entrepreneur from the US. I, um, I'm on Clubhouse these days. It's, a, it's an app that with audio rooms and uh, she, is, uh, she has put together a, a fundraising questions and answers room where I where I which I frequent and it's again I'm blown away by how much she's dedicated to giving back to the tech community now that she has had multiple exits herself and is a, um, a super angel investor. Yeah and I would completely agree I think they're both absolute ex great examples. John what about yourself who are the sort of the female tech leaders that you see? 
Yeah, well, I'm going to take a slightly different tag here because the problem is if I choose someone from the present, then I choose one of you three. The other two are going to be upset. Yeah, <laughs> choose, me, choose me, choose <laughs> me. So I'm going to go back in history and having worked the last few years of my career in transportation, I'm going to choose Bertha Ringer, um, co-inventor of the, uh, the motor car, co-founder of one of the world's great um, car companies, along with her husband, and there you'll guess it, Carl Bentz. Um, but while Carl was the, the CTO of that particular outfit, uh, she performed pretty much all the other functions. She raised the funds, she was COO, CMO, um, uh, and um, all at the same time, I think having five or six children. And probably her greatest moment was to try and prove that the motor car could um, overtake the horse. Um, she set out on the world's first ever long distance journey in a motor car, complete with two of those children. And um, yeah, kind of showed such resilience along the way. She effectively established the first ever petrol station uh, out of a pharmacy where she had to buy the fuel, repaired the car several times, uh, even invented um, the first ever li uh, brake liners um, uh, for brake discs uh, in order to get the car moving along. So um, yeah, probably a, an entrepreneur in the motor industry unequaled and even then questionably unequaled until um, Elon Musk came along. So uh, yeah, she's very much my hero. Oh, and by the way, uh, Daimler a couple of years ago did a fantastic video of her epic journey. So go onto YouTube and look for that. Fantastic. Deb, what about yourself? Who are the sort of female leaders that inspire you? Yeah, so I, I decided to actually take a different approach to this because I would agree with sort of Paulina's um, choices, but I've often come across, well, you know, when you work in the sort of startup world and small companies, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, well, well that's all very well because you've got, you know, now a few women taking a few more risks, starting their own companies, but what about actually big, large, successful multinationals? So what I want to do is give a couple of examples. Actually, people, pe people probably have never heard of them, but they would have certainly heard of the companies. So um, one of mine is a lady called um, uh, Indira Nui, which I'm sure that most people have, have not heard of. Um, but she's an Indian American woman um, who was former chief executive of PepsiCo, which obviously everyone has heard of. And she was actually credited for one of the most successful restructures of the company, linking performance with purpose. So she was equally focused on positive societal impact as much as she were, was on long-term economic growth. And in the same guise, actually, because my industry, a lot of my industry is medtech, um, Emma Wormsley, so now Dame Emma Wormsley, is chief executive of GSK, so GlaxoSmithKline. And I believe she was the first female CEO of a major pharmaceutical company. And again, she's another one who believed that Profits and purpose do not have to be traded off against each other, and actually they, they can be quite well aligned. And she's also been a, a super champion of um, innovation in the workplace. Thanks, Deb. And we've had a sort of question coming through to say, can we share the list of those? So I think we'll take that and make sure that this list of people get shared afterwards. Um, a couple from my side, just um, some of the people that I look up to from different parts of the sector. So obviously you've got the CEO of Dark Trace, Papa Gustafsson. Um, you've got the CTO of Babylon Health, Caroline Hargroves, who was previously at McLaren and was head of advanced engineering there. You've got people like um, Hayatim Salem, the chief executive of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and is really transforming the way that the engineering sector works. Irene Graham, in terms of chief executive of the Scale-Up Institute, looking at how we can support scale-up companies and also the chair of IBM, Ginny Romerti in the US. So for me, I think there's some really incredible women really shaping innovation technology in different parts of the ecosystem. And I think what's really interesting in the discussion that we've had is actually the breadth of the roles that women are taking now that sometimes we're not even aware of. And I think it's really, for me, it's really inspiring to see the breadth of women who are really, um, as you say, aligning profit and purpose, because that is a real driver for innovation in terms of the, the work they're trying to do as well from the UK in terms of building back better. So now I'm going to move on to our final myth before we open up to questions, um, which is that 
there's a myth which is women have to change. Now, I'm not sure if any of you, and John, I'm presuming that this is something you've not gone through, is one of the women in leadership training courses, but often one of the things that happens, or the ones which I've experienced, is sometimes there's questions which is, as a woman, you have to change some of your language. Um, so that you can be more heard by, by men. Whereas I think for me, I'm quite passionate about the fact that if to be an authentic leader, you have to be yourself, you know, and it's really hard to look up to somebody if they're not authentically themselves, because you can really see that and spot that. But John, I'd love to get your views around this because you've worked with a range of different women in, in your career. And what makes an authentic female leader? Yeah, I think I'm along the same lines as you that, it's exactly the same as I'd look for in a male leader. I mean, you don't have to change into something that you are not in order to, to lead an organisation. You know, if you have the right skills, the right values, the right behaviours, if you care passionately enough about your, your customers, your employees and um, uh, your products, uh, that should be enough for you. But I, I'd say I draw a distinction between... Um, having to change into something you're not and having to learn and grow in any um, organization. You know, that's just kind of part of, of what we have to do to get better. And um, perhaps just to kind of link it into something that Dev was saying earlier around how uh, she learned so much from role models who were male, but I'm pretty sure what Dev did was to pick on the, the behaviors and the approaches that those male leaders have. It didn't mean that Dev had to turn into a bloke. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> but I mean, I think Dev sort of building on that. I mean, I know at times I found it quite hard to feel different, but I thought it was also important to be myself. Dev, did you find that hard as that sort of trade off, which is, you know, that you can't be anybody than yourself, but when you're surrounded by people who are sort of acting and working differently from you, it can be really difficult. Yeah. And it's, and, and it also links back to what John said as well. It's about, you know, there's a difference between sort of, um, you know, being female and having female traits or having to take on male traits and actually just being professional and learning and developing professionally. Right. So I would say the things that I found difficult, I mean, you know, if I'm honest, I, I've made a career out of being the only female or the only ethnic minority around, around the room. And it hasn't always that difference hasn't always been necessarily a problem. You know, sometimes it's even been a good thing. I can honestly say that most people remember me, but they don't remember each other. You know, so there's things like that. But what I would say is, yes, as both of you have said, it's I think sometimes, particularly in the early days, and I'm not sure this is as much to do with the male female argument as it is maybe to do with age but you know when you're younger and you don't know what you don't know so there's sometimes if everybody around the room is different especially if they all sound the same talk the same think the same um sometimes if you have an opinion if, if inside you, you know you suddenly some, an idea comes into your head and that opinion is different to everybody else in that room it can be very difficult it can be made very difficult for you to speak up unless the person that's in charge you know so the, the, you know, the chair or the ceo or the boss has created that environment where actually they are open to different views so this is what i meant when i said well what was it? you know you know i've worked with you know men all of my life but i've picked out a couple of supervisors that influenced me because despite that environment being very different in terms of who the other people were, the way the atmosphere or the ambiance that was there that they made actually made it very easy for me to be different. Um, and that wasn't always the case. So I, I think, you know, and this always links in with confidence as well. You know, what is confidence? Is confidence learned? Is it something that, you know, you'd learn from, you know, early family values? Um, it can certainly be built on. But again, if, if you have a different opinion and you get shut down by everybody else, that can really take a hit to your confidence to then do it again. Whereas actually, if, you, if you're brave and you take that risk and actually everybody stands up and listens, that then obviously feeds to your, your confidence the next time round. So um, yeah, absolutely. I, I hope that answers your question. I think, and John, did you have any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, there's a, like a number of quite interesting kind of parts uh, to that, I mean, what I might just pick up is this thought of male versus female traits, because I always feel a little bit nervous uh, about those things, really from a point of view of not wanting to inadvertently start to reinforce some of the, the cultural stereotypes that you have. So um, yeah, I think just being a little bit cautious on that, but yeah, loads of amazing kind of 
uh, kind of revelations in what Deb was talking about. What I would add, if I may, um, instead of talking about female and male traits, I would talk about um, feminine and masculine characteristics and both genders have both of them. So as a woman, I'll have my feminine and my masculine part and both of those parts will have different leadership char characteristics and so will a man he will have a feminine and a masculine part so that's or yin and yang if you prefer to look at it this way so that's how i how i tend to look at these things i think i would sort of so if we think about diversity and inclusion it as you say john it's it becomes very very difficult because in some ways i think what we're really talking about is having the ability to have sort of leaders of companies who are welcoming of people with diverse skills, backgrounds and experiences, mm -hmm. and making sure that people who are part of those organizations can feel themselves and can be themselves at work and they can provide ideas and challenge. Because if we don't have people, if we're trying to drive innovative companies, it's impossible to do that unless people who've got great ideas can't have their eyes, can't have their ears, their sort of ideas being heard. Yeah, I could not agree more. And it really gets us into that heart around what is diversity and why you want to have diversity within an organisation. And um, yeah, if I, if I think back actually to what was essentially a startup part of the company that I'm in, yeah, which was around how do you transform into a world of electric vehicles and think of how we built the team there. And I think when we reached the point where we had 30 people we had 16 different nationalities in there. But actually, I'd have to sit down and consciously remember what the nationalities were. What I really remember is just that extraordinary diversity of thought and approach and skills and experience that it brought. Now, I'm sure there's a bit of a correlation that we got that because of the, the, um, the, the international kind of spread as well as the gender spread within that group. But if you turn it the other way around, had we had people are all very international and 50% of each gender, but we had programmed them to think like clones, then we would have actually totally missed the point of uh, diversity. And um, yeah, I think that's a really good point, which is how do we make sure that people are able to be themselves? Mm, because otherwise, yeah. especially if we're talking about innovation, we need, you know, it's so, it's, we talked about risk earlier. There are so many risks in trying to do something new for the first time. Mm -hmm. We may need as many ideas as possible to help both make that idea come alive, but also to do, to reduce risk as well. And if you've only got, if you've got group think, it's never healthy, whatever yeah. group it is. Indeed, and particularly when you're talking about innovation and entrepreneurship, you know, the very heart of which is to have a completely different take of what you're seeing in the market. Yeah, if you're coming up and saying, well, actually, I see the market as being exactly the same as everybody else, that's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah, it's, um, it's those people who look at the very same world, the very same facts, and see a different angle to it. Uh, now, in reality, irrespective of your gender, in a world that tends to like conformity, you're always going to get a bit of pressure. You know, oh, my goodness, he's off on one again. You're always going to get that. So um, as a leader, you have to try to counteract that cultural conformity um, and try to welcome it. Or I think as um, one of our previous chief execs used to always say, always listen to the quietest voice in the room because more often than not, they're going to be the ones with the real key insight. Uh, and I think that's a very, very good point. And I think one of the things I just want to move on to now, if everybody's happy, is to move on to a few of the questions that come through from chat and in the Q&A. So I'm going to start with one of the first questions in the chat from Susan Pais to the panellists. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Dev, which is, what's your opinion about making your passion into a business? And what happens if you fail at that? And how do you move on? Because that's it's it's very very personal if you really care about something and it doesn't work yeah i mean yeah this is interesting because this has been the common theme i think throughout both both um uh, mine and paulina's sort of perspectives um i would say look if you if you have a passion and you want to turn it into a business i mean all i can say is you know absolutely go for it because um you know 
this is this is partly my personality because I would say, well, what have you got to lose? But if you remember, I did also touch on how I started and actually being in a position in my life where I could afford to. So I think it's absolutely right what the others have been saying in the sense that you shouldn't be afraid to fail. So you shouldn't be afraid to follow that passion and take a risk. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You'll be all right. You can do something else. But again, the the, the time to make that choice is is different, I guess, for every individual, because as I said, as I, I left a full-time job to do it, but I, I could do it at that stage in my life because I had some capital behind me. I might not have been able to do it any earlier or any later, you know? Um, so I would say in terms of that, it's, it's, you know, it's got to be a personal decision, but you shouldn't not do it for fear of failure. Okay, that's number one. And then I would say, and then if you do do it and then you do fail, how do you move on? Well, you know, as, as I think you've heard, it's, I think it's very difficult when people, people like us sit there and say, well, we've made a success out of this, because as you know, the stories that make the news are only ever the successes. And actually people don't talk about failures as much, but this is now starting to happen. And it's, it's the same actually in, in STEM subjects, in, in science and in academia, not just in entrepreneurship. So I would say, if you think about the statistics, I think it's something like, you know, 95% of startups, certainly in high tech and biotech fail, right? But you only ever hear about the other five. But actually, many people that have made a success out of their current company, if they admit it, will have probably had a string of failures beforehand that they have learned from. So I would almost say that failure is almost, you know, you can get lucky, anyone can get lucky, but it's almost essential to have those learning lessons to know what you need to do to then make what you want. And I don't know if Dev, if this resonates with you, but one of the things which, especially after having a company, you know, my first company, we did scale it, we sold it to Atkins, it was, it was a good exit. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things you learn once you've done the first company is that success is a combination of hard work, um, mm -hmm. luck, good timing, um, a good idea, luck, hard work, good time and good idea, but we shouldn't underestimate the fact that luck can either work behind you and give you energy, or you could just have a great idea, but it's the wrong time in the market. And so the more you realize that, you know, you can be working really, really hard, but it still might fail and that's okay, because actually that's, it's normal. Yeah, and absolutely. And to lead on to that, to think, what are the other options and alternatives? I mean, I'm a really big champion for trying to educate younger people that actually taking a non-traditional approach to employment is equally valid, you know, because, you know, I think a lot of people, especially with, you know, with my prior to my um, sort of entrepreneurial career, I had a very traditional um, academic education where, you know, most people just sort of went on to like, you know, the grad, sque the, the grad schemes and, and, you know, sort of, you know, work their way up in a, in a, in a, in a multinational. Now that, that's an equally valid approach, but yeah. it, shouldn't, it shouldn't mean that a different approach is any less valid. And, and again, if you, if you, you know, for me, the decision was very easy because I was trained to be a very independent thinker to go from that and into a, the world of work as, as, a, as a tiny cog in a big machine was to me, I found that quite boring and repetitive. And you know, if you've got a passion and an idea and you want to do lots of different things, um, you know, then actually starting your own company can really bring that. But again, it just depends. It, it, again, you know, there's, there's a part of personality here as well, isn't there? In terms of, you know, do you get bored easily? Can you, can you, can you pursue something with a passion and, you know, tenacity, perseverance, these sorts of things. Exactly as you said, it's hard work, but it's also not giving up when the rest of the world wants to give up. Uh, and I love that piece, that sort of the tenacity that you need. And I think there's a really interesting comment from Samaya. Um, and I know that, Paulina, you, not, you sort of answered this a bit on the chat, but it'd be really good to sort of bring that a bit more to attention. Because um, it, was it wasn't a question, it was an observation around the kind of the cultural and family upbringing that becomes a foundation of confidence and how to learn that later in life. And I think, certainly from my side, I don't think, I didn't grow up with it. I didn't have a huge amount of confidence, but... I sort of learned that and I realized that I was quite shy, I was quite quiet as a child, but I was bored with myself. And so I set myself challenges and forced myself outside my comfort zone. And that helped me sort of, but you build that confidence over time. Paulina, did you have any thoughts around that? 
Yeah, so I wouldn't say that I was particularly confident as a child, as a teenager. It's definitely something that uh, I acquired later in life and I'm still working on, to be honest. There are days where I have lower confidence and lower esteem and there are days where I feel on top of it. So um, I am a huge, huge advocate of personal development work and whatever works for you there, it could be uh, coaching, therapy, um, all, all sorts of leadership frameworks that you could look at and personal, de personal development frameworks, more traditional and less traditional and more alternative. So um, I feel that no matter what background you come from, you will have to face challenges as an adult in an adult life. And you'll have to kind of, there will be a point where you need to redefine yourself and really find your own place, which is independent of where you grew up, grew up and which is, an independent place from where you grew, grew out from. So um, I think it's it's a bit of both. It helps to have that kind of confidence um, instilled into you as a young person, but most definitely you have to work on yourself as an adult to succeed in the entrepreneurial space. Mm -hmm. I, would, I very much agree. And I don't know, it'd be good to get sort of Dev and Paulina your view. I mean, for me, having mentors has always been absolutely critical, having peer mentors, having a range of different mentors to support me on the different roles that I do. Um, you know, everything from when sharing things for the first time through to, you know, looking at how to approach sales marketing. You know, for me, mentors have always been really key. Um, is this something that both of you have used in terms of sort of gaining, gaining that confidence and those skills? Um, yeah, well, so I, I can go first because I've got an interesting view on this. I would say yes and no. So um, in the early days of my, the, the startups that I was involved in co-founding, I was quite lucky in that, uh, like Paulino, I think I had a few business partners. And then those business partners were always somebody that was sort of had, you know, 20, 25 years on me and had, you know, been the, the serial entrepreneur with the multiple exits. So I'd been there and done that. So I kind of always had someone you know, to, to bounce, bounce, bounce off. I did have a few mentors and I've got both good and bad experiences in it. I think, yes, when, you, when you're lacking a skill set and you can basically find that in somebody that wants to, you know, genuinely has a passion to help someone else, I think that works very well. I've also got, you know, playing devil's advocate on that side, I found as a startup founder, really the things that I just needed people to do. And there, sometimes there are many, many people who would advise but that advice did not turn into doing. And sometimes, you know, sometimes some of these mentors were people that had been there and done it before or were very successful in a big multinational or something. But then translating that to how a startup would work, it didn't necessarily, you know, because, you know, I worked with some people that worked in really big multinationals and they were super senior in their roles. But it was very clear that their environment was they'd have a 50 strong team to do everything when and then when you go from that to a startup and it's literally like, you know, five people having to do 20 things. It, it was actually the, the, the advice was not directly translatable. So I know. So I've also seen sometimes where that goes wrong as well. So I think it is a good thing. But if that mentorship is very well aligned between the entrepreneur and the mentor. What about yourself, Paulina? A similar experience? totally a massive advocate of having mentors and people you look up to and people that kind of speak to you that are further down the, ro the, the road than you are massive advocate of that uh, definitely and of a wider kind of support community so family friends who believe in you who champion you um, again people who are more senior to you people that are may maybe more junior uh, who you give back to or who you mentor in exchange for being mentored by somebody else. So I really believe in having a mentor and also in paying it forward and mentoring people uh, who are uh, looking up to you. And I recently have been part of um, Cherry Blair's uh, foundation, which uh, for women from developing countries that are being um, mentored by women from the UK and other Western European countries. And I mentored somebody from India uh, who has a small tech company and it's been a beautiful experience for both of us and we still stay in touch. And I think there's a question from Susan to say, how do you find a mentor? And from my side, it's 
it started off with people in my network who I've admired and have asked them for some advice. So for me, it's been quite informal to begin with, and then it's sometimes formalized from there onwards. Um, but John, I'm assuming, but I could be wrong, that you get asked to mentor quite a bit. So what is your role around mentorship and how do you feel about mentorship? Yeah, I mean, it's really important. It's something I've benefited from myself personally. And so there's a strong compulsion to try to put back. So uh, I don't think I can ever remember an occasion where someone's asked me for mentoring support and I've said no. Uh, there have been a few times where I've questioned, am I the best person? Am I suitable? But no, really important to do it. Um, so, uh, and yeah, if I look at the sort of gender split, it's probably been kind of 50-50. And I'm delighted to say that some of those people I've mentored have ended up actually ending up higher up the corporate tree than I am. Uh, in fact, actually, one good thing always check if you're looking at a new boss is have they uh, developed somebody to actually be higher above them in an organization? If the words no and they're not the chief executive, then you ought to be asking some questions. So, yeah, really important. I mean, clearly for a mentoring discussion, it has to be quite uncomfortable on occasions and that requires maturity on both sides. And that can make it a little bit uncomfortable if you have that gender split. So yeah, both sides have to work on it. And actually tying into one of the earlier points around family, um, I've always felt that probably the best mentors I've ever had have been my children. Um, I found my leadership style changed markedly because once you've got little toddlers, you realize the limitations on telling somebody to do something. And you realize it's kind of far more subtle the way that you have to uh, you know, develop it. And of course, whereas employees can always kind of leave, um, you've got your kids for life. So um, there's a very strong uh, oh, kind of requirement to, to do best by them. But equally going back the way, a test I often apply to myself in leadership is if I wouldn't do something to my children, why on earth would I do it to my employees? Yeah, there's a lot of correspondence between those two relationships. And I think it's, it's really interesting that kind of the importance of influencing skills and sort of really putting yourself in the perspective of the person you're mentoring because, you know, and I don't know about you, John, but I find if I'm mentoring somebody, I learn as much myself you know, as you're trying to commit. So, you know, it doesn't really matter who you're sort of, what the role is between mentor and mentee. I think mm -hmm. a good relationship everybody learns from. Mm -hmm. um, I just realized we're in the last few minutes. There's, uh, there's a very specific question, Paulina, can I get you to answer from Natalie, which was, what's your advice and experience around pre-seed funding and crowdfunding? Um, she's at a very early stage and feel there aren't very many accessible options. So do you have any places to point um, Natalie in to provide support? Uh, Natalie, you're welcome to email me. It's Paulina, my first name, Grant Tree. That, which is my company, G-R-A-N-T-T-R-E-E.co.uk. I'll put, I'll put that in the chat box as well. Um, yeah, happy to have a chat. Um, so there are, there's AngelList, there are places and spaces where you can meet at least stage, stage investors. Depending on what product or service you are developing, crowdfunding may or may not be a good idea. If it's a consumer product, for example, crowdfunding tends to work really, really well. But you need to bear in mind that if you approach a company like Crowdcube to have a campaign with them, you have to have at least 30%, so one third of the funding that you're looking to raise committed from angel investors. So it's really important to be speaking to people. It's never too early to start speaking to an investor. Uh, and, you know, bear in mind that maybe there are alternative ways for you to raise money. I have a grant funding company, so grants are also a really interesting way to kind of uh, acquire some funding to help you with your growth. And also, you may simply want to rely on revenues from customers. So it's not always, always the case that you'll need to raise funding. It really depends on the type of business you have an ambition to create. So yeah, happy to have a quick chat. Wonderful, thank you very much. And so with a minute to go, I just want to say a huge thank you, Dev, John, Paulina. I really appreciated all your insights today. 
um, and hopefully we provided a little bit of a challenge back around some of the assumptions that sometimes there is around women lacking competence, taking risks, leading tech, and the fact that women can be authentic leaders and lead tech companies to the future. So, you know, a huge thank you from all of from me and to all of the questions and responses um, in the chat today as well. It was excellent. Thank you very much.